John Pilger, your response. Well, uh, look, uh, uh, Richard Holbrook uh, is the embodiment of um, <clears throat> rapacious U.S. policy. Um, uh, the, and I think there's something interesting here in uh, the, uh, all the commemoration of uh, his career that has gone on. Um, uh, interesting in regard to the WikiLeaks issue, because here we have, and it's not only in the United States, as here as well, this great peacemaker, this great statesman has passed on. Well, that's just not true. Uh, and if we'd had uh, a kind of WikiLeaks uh, a uh, glimpse of uh, the truth of Holbrook's uh, career. We might not be getting all these uh, effusions at the moment. Um, just going back a little bit earlier in my experience, Amy, then I would bring it up to East Timor. But um, my first um, <coughs> uh, knowledge of Richard Holbrook's involvement was when uh, the foreign minister of uh, Vietnam, uh, Nguyen Co Tuck, in 1978, told me in confidence, Tuck is now dead, so I, I'm sure I can speak about this. <clears throat> he told me that um, Holbrook, in 1978, had given him assurances that the uh, administration, uh, of which he was a, a leading member, of course, at the time, uh, the Carter administration, uh, would, uh, if not normalised with Vietnam, then it would lift the, the siege, and it was an economic siege, an embargo, um, uh, Trading with the Enemy Act was then being imposed on the Vietnamese. There was terrible hardship and starvation in Vietnam, uh, all of it a, a policy of revenge for expelling the Americans three years later. Holbrook uh, had... Um, said to uh, Tuck, who was, uh, they met together in New York in 1978, uh, and uh, 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 Holbrook had told him to wait for a call. And Tuck said, I waited in the Holiday Inn on, uh, I think, uh, West 42nd Street for four days, waiting for a call from Holbrook, which he'd promised uh, to, uh, to let me have and to describe the new policy towards Vietnam, and it never came. He refused to answer my messages, uh, and the, uh, the, the imposition of extreme austerity as a policy of revenge continued. That always seemed to me to sum up the kind of duplicitous nature of uh, Holbrook's role Certainly, as you rightly described, and it's very interesting listening to Alan Nairn's excellent questioning of, of Holbrook there. Um, I mean, I was told by um, uh, the senior CIA uh, official in the uh, embassy in Jakarta at the time, Philip Lichty, appears in my film, uh, of the kind of um, support uh, that the... Uh, uh, that the uh, regime in Jakarta was getting of uh, aircraft, <coughs> uh, logistics, Broncos, um, logistics, armaments, uh, all kinds of support that were going directly, directly into East Timor in spite of public declarations by the likes of Holbrook that this was not happening. I wanted to uh, fast forward. So, as Lichty made clear... John, I, we, because we just have two minutes, mm -hmm. uh, we have so many areas to cover. I wanted to fast forward to Yugoslavia, where, Jeremy, okay. you lived and covered for, for years. Um, talk about um, your experience. Well, you know, Richard Holbrook was a central player in the disintegration of Yugoslavia in the 1990s. Everyone knows, the whole world knows, Slobodan Milosevic was a mass murderer and a thug. Radovan Kadajic, Rakko Mladic, all of these Bosnian Serb leaders, they were thugs. What never gets talked about is that what Richard Holbrook and other U.S. officials were doing was supporting Croatian ethnic 
ethnic cleansers that were trained by a U.S. private military company, MPRI, to engage in the single greatest ethnic cleansing of the war against the Serbs in Kraina. Then you fast forward to, the, to later in the Clinton administration. Richard Holbrooke was a key player um, in essentially providing a false pretext for war over Kosovo against Slobodan Milosevic, known as the Rambouillet Accord. The U.S. essentially said to Slobodan Milosevic, if you don't sign an agreement that would allow us to occupy your country, allow you to take control of your media outlets, allow our forces to be immunized from prosecution in your country, we are going to bomb you. Richard Holbrooke delivered that ultimatum to Slobodan Milosevic following the Rambouillet discussion. Milosevic, like any leader in the world, rejected an occupation agreement, and so the United States bombed. Holbrooke, when you and I questioned him later um, at the Overseas Press Club in uh, April of 1999, denied uh, that he had ever said that that was an occupation agreement, when, in fact, he had said it on Charlie Rose's show. At that same event where you and I confronted Richard Holbrooke, the Overseas Press Club Award, he celebrated the bombing of radio television Serbia after Eason Jordan, the president of CNN International, told him it had been bombed, and he said that it was, uh, it was a positive development. Um, on a night when they were honoring foreign correspondents, Richard Holbrooke was praising the, the outright murder of media workers, 16 media workers, including makeup artists and engineers. None of Milosevic's propagandists killed. RTS was not taken off the air. It was a war crime, according to Amnesty International, and praised by Richard Holbrooke. To me, that's the embodiment of what his career has meant in terms of its, its projection of U.S. power around the world. There are good victims and bad victims. The media workers of radio television Serbia, they deserve to die that day. But the journalists of the United States or China or North Korea who get imprisoned uh, in, in, in foreign countries, those are worthy victims. The same can be said about the way the U.S. prosecuted its war in Yugoslavia and in Iraq, Turkey with the Kurds, Richard Holbrooke at the center of it for his whole career. Well, a uh, very critical analysis. Jeremy Scahill, John Pilger, I want to thank you both. Uh, this is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org. A happy birthday to Nicole Salazar. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for joining us.